Take your Bibles and turn with me to Proverbs chapter 30, if you would, please. Proverbs chapter 30, you will find that on page 589 in the church Bibles, if you'd like to use one of those and follow along. And of course, we would encourage you to do so today. Uh, we are continuing in this uh, annual financial series called Wisdom with Wealth. And this is the fourth of the series. It's, uh, and, and last week in message three, we ventured into this book of wisdom, into the book of Proverbs. And uh, we talked about trusting the Lord with all our hearts. We talked about acknowledging him in all our ways. And we realized, hey, that includes trusting him and acknowledging him even in our finances. Amen. And this week, we are going to continue looking at several other Proverbs that will further encourage us to trust and to acknowledge what God has said in his word about practicing wisdom with wealth. There is a story about a pilot who would always look down intently at a certain valley in the Appalachian Mountains every time that he flew his plane over it. And one day, his co-pilot asked him, he said, hey, what is so interesting about this spot? He said, I have noticed that every time we pass over this, you just kind of disappear from us for a time, and then you rejoin us back here in reality afterwards. So, so what gives, what is it about this spot? And the pilot replied, pointing down, he said, you see that stream over there? He said, when I was a child, I used to sit on a log over there, and I would fish all day. And every time an airplane would fly overhead, I would think and I would, I would look up in the sky and I would wish to myself, I wish I were flying. But nowadays, I find that every time I fly over, I look down wishing I was just fishing. It is always tempting for us to think to ourselves that if things were just different or if we had it like others do or that if we just had a little bit more, then we would be content. And that goes doubly in the area of wealth and finances. But the flaw of this mindset is that contentment cannot be achieved by increasing possessions or positions. You know, the whole world itself would never satisfy you. It would never be enough. Proverbs 27, 20, in fact, tells us hell and destruction are never full. So the eyes of man are never satisfied. You know, a content man, a content woman, those are people who have great wealth. Contentment brings great wealth. The successful Hollywood actor and comedian Jim Carrey once said, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that that is not the answer. In another interview, more recently, he said, uh, it's crazy, somewhere in the middle of absolute confusion, absolute disappointment. The fruition of all my dreams, standing there with everything that anyone else could ever dream about having and be unhappy. You know, Jim Carrey, to this day, at least to my knowledge, is still searching for contentment and satisfaction in this life. But he will never find it down here. In fact, no one will find it down here because contentment does not come from seeking things from below. It comes from seeking those things that come from above. And this is not necessarily a message of, uh, a message of salvation, but let me just kind of take a moment right here. We're going to be talking about contentment and, and, and uh, financial things and intangible things. But if you're here today and you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm telling you, you will never find contentment and peace in your soul ever, ever, unless if you receive Christ as your Savior. You receive him as Lord through belief. What he's done for you on the cross by dying for your sins and raising again three days later, proving that God received that sacrifice and an atonement for your sins. You believe on him today. You put your faith and trust in him today. You will have peace. You will have contentment in your soul about your eternity. He will be holding fast to you and you will be guaranteed a place in heaven. But, but we're talking about finances today. How many of y'all would love to have peace and contentment when it comes to the area of wealth and finances? Hopefully you have found your way to Proverbs chapter 30. This is one of the unique instances in the book of Proverbs where the author is not Solomon. 
But instead, the writer identifies himself in verse 1 as Agur, who is the son of Yake, or Jakey, as it's spelled. But this is the only place where he and his father are mentioned anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere else. And and so he is somewhat a a, a complete mystery to us other than what we have here in Proverbs chapter 30. But in the opening verses, what happens is is Agur, he confesses right out of the gate that, that he doesn't consider himself to be a wise man. But if you read a few verses into it, you will find that he states that he believes that the word of God is is perfect or pure is the word that he uses. And and that word pure is the same word as in to purify something. So like whenever they would put metals into into heat and they would cause all the the inconsistencies and all the dross to kind of come to the top and they would remove all the flaws out of it. And, And he uses that word pure in relation to the word of God saying, hey, the word of God, there are no inconsistencies. There are no flaws. There is no dross there. It's absolutely perfect and the reason I bring that out is because though he doesn't consider himself to be wise the fact that he says that the word of God is perfect and pure that right there shows us one thing he's got a little measure of wisdom to him and and since we're here in in chapter 30 the reason I brought us here is why the reason why is because of what he writes here in verses 7 through 9 these words here that a girl writes, and he does so in, in the form of a prayer or of a petition that he presents unto God And beginning in verse 7, he writes this. Two things have I required of thee. Now, now by the way, that Hebrew word required, it's translated in our Bibles as the word ask 94 times. 22 times it's translated as inquire, and only seven times is it translated as require. And and so I bring that up because I don't want you to think that Agur is demanding anything from God here. No, no, no. He is humbly asking God for this. And so he says, two things have I required of thee. Deny me not before, or deny me not them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. And then he explains, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and take the name of my God in vain. What we have here in this prayer from Agur is a plea for contentment. Contentment for the things that God has and the th- contentment for the things that God will provide for him in his life. That word convenient, or yeah, convenient at the end of verse eight, this is very important. In fact, we're going to come back to this at the very end of the message. So please, uh, please understand and remember what we're going to learn here about this word convenient. But, but the word convenient, I believe, is the spirit behind this whole prayer that he offers. This word refers to what has been ordained or what has been decreed. Oh, basically, this is a reference to an allotted portion. Something that has, has been uh, proportioned for him. In other words, a girl simply wanted to only want what God determined for him. Let me say that again. Agur only wanted to want what God had determined for him. Nothing more and nothing less. You see, because to have more than what was necessary, he would have been tempted to sin by, by being reliant upon himself instead of being reliant upon God. And thus, it would cause him to question his need for the Lord and his need for God's provision in his life. But for him to have less than what was needed daily, I mean, to to be put in in genuine poverty, that might tempt him to sin by feeling like he needed to go out and to steal in order to make ends meet or to put food on the table. This this is the spirit behind Agur's prayer. He, He wants only to want what God has determined or allotted for him. And by the way, the fact that he's praying this shows us that he is struggling to want, to only want what God has for him. Amen? Can you relate with that? You know that you should only want what God wants for you, but you struggle to want to want what he wants for you. And this is where Agur finds himself. He doesn't want to pray for riches. He doesn't want to pray for poverty because both of those extremes lead to their own deceptions. 
You see, one leads to the deception that I don't need to rely upon the Lord. I mean, look at all the money and look at all the resources and look at the safety nets and look at my savings that I've provided for myself. I mean, I don't need God to provide for me. I'm doing pretty good on my own. And the other extreme leads to the deception that I can't rely upon the Lord. I mean, I have to take matters into my own hands here. I have to handle them my own way. I tried to do it the way that God wants me to do it and look at where it's got me. I mean, I, I'm stretched to make ends meet. I, can't, I don't know where uh, the next bill is going to come from. And so now I'm just going to have to roll my sleeves. I'm just going to have to do things my own way. I can't rely upon the Lord. I've got to rely upon my own vices. And if that means I've got to compromise some morals, if that means I've got to break some rules, if that means I have to go outside the boundaries of the law, then so be it because I just can't count on the Lord to provide. That's the temptation. And that's the deception of the other extreme, poverty. Agur prays, I want only to want what you want me to have, God. That's it. And I'm sure that this is not new news to anybody here. But we live in a day, an age, in a society that is inundated with the want for more. And with discontentment. Everywhere you turn. There are advertisements and commercials and celebrities telling you, hey, we see you. We see the life you're living. We know you're not happy. We know you're not content. But listen, you're only one purchase away from happiness. If you just buy this product of mine, if you just buy this thing that I'm selling, then you'll have happiness and it will satisfy. Sadly, with the influx, of social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all those things, it has made the sense of discontentment, of greed, of covetousness, of, uh, of jealousy way too easy and way too commonplace for many of us. People are constantly comparing the things that they see there posted on other people's feeds. They're comparing those things to their lives. They're comparing what they have they're comparing what they get. They're comparing where they go. They're comparing what they get to do. But what these people don't understand is as they're looking at these, this post after post and feed after feed is that out of the pool of 500 or so people that they're following, uh, of course, there's at least one who's going to get a new car this month. And of course, there's probably another who might get engaged. And then someone else who might go on a vacation or someone who might get a, uh, we want to leave the men out of here, might get a new gun, right? Because we're not, we're not exempt from this either, men. I mean, out of the 500 plus people that are, are revealed there in their feeds, surely one is getting to do that. But you know what we think? After reading all these posts where they post only the highlights of their life, we, we shut the app or we walk away from the compu computer thinking, man, we are the only ones in the world who are not living this wonderful life, who is not satisfied with my life, who, who is living this, this, or is in the state of, of not being able to be content with my life. We think that we are the only ones and everybody else is living a better life than I am. Come on, people. They don't consider that that was only four people out of the 500 or so that they're following. And they think they're the only ones. They continually feed this discontentment multiple times a day. Let me just tell you, they named that right. It's called feeds that you're following there. And I think some of us just need to fast from the feeds, amen? But they feed this state of discontentment every time they click and they scroll and they scroll and they read and they read and here's the deal they compare their life to other people's let me just tell you comparison is an enemy of contentment but people are making foolish financial decisions amongst other foolish decisions based off this but we're dealing with finances today but they're making foolish financial decisions based off their growing discontentment Someone said, and I couldn't track it down, but they said, never have we had more and enjoyed less. Boy, there's a mouthful. When, when we, we learn that money does not bring happiness and stuff never satisfies, when will we learn that? These are part of the vanity and the lies that Agur is praying that he would have removed far from him in verse 8. These are part of the lies and the vanity that he wants God to remove from his life. 
And before we get to that, the, the lies and the vanity, I believe it is key for us to take note how he begins this petition in verse 8. I want you to look at it again. Agur starts out there in verse 8 by saying, remove far from me vanity and lies. Remove. Notice what he's doing here. He's asking the Lord to remove these things from him for him. He's asking the Lord to remove these things. Agur is not so presumptuous as to assume that it is within his own willpower to be able to resist such temptations of this discontentment, friends. He understands his weakness. This shows wisdom in the man. He's probably tried and he finally realizes, I can't do this. God, remove this from me. He calls out to God to remove it. You understand that it is not natural. For us to be content with what we have. You know that, right? When I say natural, what I mean is it it is not natural for our carnal nature, for our our, our fallen sin nature of the, the fallen sin nature of mankind, which we all have. It is not natural for us to be content. But rather, it comes naturally for us to be discontent. It is natural for us to be uh, to be covetous. If you have any question or doubts as to the truth of that statement, I'd encourage you just go sit in the nursery one of these days. And you examine those toddlers with the toys. One of them can be sitting there enjoying himself, just playing with his little toy that he has. And then another toddler gets dropped off and that toddler goes on over to the toy bin and he pulls out another toy. And so that all of a sudden the one over here who was all happy with the toy that he had before now realizes there's another toy they can play here. And all of a sudden, he wants what that toddler has over there. And you hear the subtle, but the clear words, mine, come out of his mouth. Mine. Oh, sure, that other toy had been there the whole time. In fact, that first toddler had walked by that toy in the toy bin on his way to get the other toy that he had been playing with. But now that he sees it in the hands of this other one, all of a sudden, he wants that toy. I'm telling you, it doesn't come naturally for us to be content. And and I'm not just talking about toddlers here. This is all of us. Amen. Why? Because it's natural for us to to, to covet and not be content. You know, you don't have to teach your kids to covet or to be greedy or discontent. But we do have to be taught to be content with what we have. Amen. Amen. You get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. Even the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, he said, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound everywhere and in all things. I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Paul says in verse 11, he had to learn contentment, meaning it had to be taught to him. It didn't come naturally for him. When he found himself in hard times, times when he lacked the the basic necessities of life, he had to learn to be content in those times. Even though he was faced with hunger, even though he was in bonds, even though he he was suffering in those moments, he had to learn to be content, knowing that his God would never leave him nor forsake him, as Hebrews tells us. And therefore, it was God's will. If it was God's will for Paul's life to continue on, then God was going to provide what Paul needed in order to continue on. He had to learn that. He also had to learn that when he found himself in abundant times, that his contentment was not found in those things that he had, in the wealth and in the comforts and in the freedoms that he was experiencing, but rather his contentment was found in Jesus Christ. God could remove all those other things in just a moment's notice, but his relationship with Christ would be forever. That would never go away. And God's plan And God's purpose for Paul's life would still remain. Whether he had plenty or whether he had little, God's plan and his purpose for his life would still remain. And thus Paul writes concerning contentment. I, by the way, this is concerning contentment. I can do all things through Christ. Listen, it it wasn't through Paul. 
It wasn't through his own self-willpower or, or his, 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 uh, his decision to, have, uh, to, be, to rise above his circumstances or, or to have um, uh, willpower over his circumstances. I can't think of the word I'm trying to say, but it wasn't about Paul. It wasn't because he's some super saint that he was able to learn this, this contentment. No, listen, contentment is not you conquering your circumstances. Contentment is not simply convincing yourself that you are content. It's not just a state of mind that you decide one day, I'm just going to be this way today. That's not contentment. That's what the Stoics, the, the Greek philosophers were teaching in that, that day. Contentment comes when you understand that God is sovereign over all things and I can trust him in his sovereignty. That's where contentment comes. And therefore, at the end of the day, all of the things that you have, as well as all the things that you don't have, after a day, now catch this, of following after the Lord, after a day of, uh, of following his Holy Spirit, the leading of the Holy Spirit, and following the word of God, at the end of the day, you understand both that what you have, as well as what you don't have, is your Heavenly Father's portion that he has allotted to you. That's contentment. That's where it's found. And he is just and he is generous and he he is fair to do what he will with what is his he is just he is generous and he is fair and if you have any questions or any doubts to that if you feel like you've been cheated by god somehow some way that he has unjustly withheld from you the things that you see uh, he gives to other people then let me just tell you let's load up in the church van after services today and we'll drive down to the south side of oklahoma city and we will drop you off under one of those bridges and we'll drop you off in one of those alleys and we'll let you talk to those people down there and their families and then you come back here and you tell us how much god has withheld from you his goodness and his generosity I'm telling you, God is good. Amen. We could take you to the children's hospital. We could let you tour the cancer ward. Don't tell me God isn't good and he hasn't been generous in your life. Both what you have as well as what you don't have, that's your Heavenly Father's portion. And he has personally allotted that portion to you. And he is good in doing so. Once we learn and we see that all that our good father has given to us is out of his good grace, then we will begin to learn contentment. And you can be content with such things as you have. Listen, contentment goes so much further than simply being satisfied with where you are. But rather, it's knowing that God has a plan for your life and you're living it right now. Not when he gives you the next thing, then you start living his plan. No, you're living his plan right now. And that as you continue to follow his plan and you continue to follow his will through obedience, he will continue to provide for you as is needed. That's contentment. That right there. But let's get back to what I said earlier. It was through Christ that Paul received contentment. It was through Christ that he received the strength to be content in whatever state he was in. And similarly, back to our original text here in Proverbs 30, it is a girl asking God. It's through God's power that he's asking that he remove far from him vanity and lies. It isn't through sheer, will, sheer willpower. It isn't through a new mindset. It isn't by you turning over a new leaf, but it is by calling for and depending upon the power and the strength of God to be content. That's where you find contentment. Yes, you must have a willing heart. But it is not by our power that we will learn to be content. We must regularly depend upon God for it. And so now I want you to notice the two things that Agur prayed for. The vanity and the lies to be removed. First of all, the vanity. The vanity is the emptiness and the wastefulness of chasing after the riches, the wealth, and the possessions, everything that this world offers to you. That is the vanity of it, thinking that it is going to provide you with contentment and satisfaction. Friends, that'll never happen. It's an empty pursuit. 
It's like a thirsty man trying to quench his thirst with salt water. And yet the more that he drinks, the more thirsty he becomes. That's vanity. And that's the vanity of chasing after more wealth and more finances and more possessions in order to find contentment. Listen, the more of that that you get, the more you will desire. The more that your desire will grow for those things. And out of that greater desire, your, your, your discontentment will grow even greater. Friends, it's salt water. You won't find contentment by, by, by grasping to the things of this world. Jesus said that a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesseth in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. In other words, there is more to it. There's more to this life. There's more to it than this, the abundance of things. A whole lot more. And those things will never satisfy your eternal soul. Those things will never satisfy the itch that you have. It will only cause you to want more. If you cannot receive what you have right now with a grateful and thankful heart to God and be content with it, I'm telling you, nothing he gives you from here on out will make you content. Nothing. Solomon was an extremely wealthy man. And God, God gave him that ability. If you study scripture, God gave him the ability to create wealth. And he would pretty much had everything, every material thing that his heart desired. Everything, all the, all the best and the brightest and the greatest uh, that this world offered to him, he had it. And if he didn't have it, he had the means to get it. Not only did he have the means to get it because he was the wealthiest man at the time, but he also had the means to get it because he was a king. So he had the power to get it. But I want you to listen to what Solomon wrote. In Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 10, he said, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. Vanity. This is the thing that Agur prays to God concerning. That God would remove such vanity far from him. That he would not waste his life chasing the wind, so to speak. Working, his, 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 uh, working away his whole life in this vain effort to find some sort of lasting peace and some sort of contentment from what this world offers. Listen, it can never be provided by the world. It's only comes in, it only comes through God. Proverbs 14.30 tells us, A sound heart is the life of the flesh, but, the envy, but envy is the rottenness of the bones. In other words, it will destroy you. You look at what other people have and you envy them and you desire to have what they have because you're not content. That will destroy you. It'll eat you out like rottenness of the bones. Cancer. Attacking the marrow of your bones. Also Ecclesiastes 4, 6, Solomon writes, better is a handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. What that means is it's better. To only get what you need. It is better for you to work and to only earn what you need, just that handful, and to be able to get rest and peace with it than for you to work yourself to death. That's, that's the, the travail and the vexation of spirit here. It's better than to work yourself to death in order to get more, both hands full. And in the process, you destroy yourself. Boy, that is something that we can read and we can say, but to actually live it out and to express it in our hearts, that's a whole other thing altogether, isn't it? We work ourselves to death just to get more than what we really need. For what? To keep up with the neighbors? To keep up with the, the boys over at the office? To keep up with the, those other ladies at the gym? To, to uh, keep up with that irritating in-law every Christmas who comes by and he's always bragging about his annual profit margin? I mean, again, I ask, for what? Why are we doing this? To provide a better life when we're actually destroying the life of those we love. Working ourselves to death. Perhaps there's someone here today who ought to be praying this part of Agor's prayer and say, God, remove far from me this vanity. I don't want to... Chase the wind with my whole life trying to find peace and contentment with things of this world. It's a waste of my life, God. Remove that vanity far from me. We've got to be careful. I understand about what, what we say here and what I'm talking about when, when we speak of being content. And hopefully you have the discernment to understand what I'm saying. Because we're not speaking about 
uh, speaking out against being ambitious and, and being motivated, you know, taking the things, that, that portion that God has allotted to you and actually investing it and making it increase or making it better. We're not speaking against that when we say you need to be content. But we're also not speaking and trying to advocate for laziness or for complacency either because those aren't bi- biblical. As with most things in the Christian life, there's a balance to this. And we are to be stewarding. We are to be maintaining. We are to be taking care of the things that God has entrusted unto us, the, the portion that he's allotted to us as individuals. And so just for an example, and I know this sounds kind of silly, but just for an example, if your dryer breaks down and it needs to be repaired or replaced, then by all means, repair or replace it. Don't sit there and say, well, uh, it burned up. I'm just going to be content. I guess I can just hang the clothes outside on the fence and let them dry. For crying out loud, repair the dryer or buy a new one. If God's provided the means for you to do so and it doesn't take away from you robbing and cause you to rob God or other commitments that you have, by all means, that is not discontentment to say, well, the dryer's old now kaput. We got to go buy a new one. Oh, you, you're just so discontent chasing that American dream. A dryer? But you know what I'm saying here. Good stewardship, yes. But our contentment is found in Jesus Christ. Maybe I hope this story, because it's rather lengthy, I hope it makes a clear picture for you what I'm trying to say. There's the story of this older gentleman who sold sandwiches from his sandwich stand in the city. And there was a younger man, a businessman, who every day, would come by and he would buy a sandwich from this man at his stand. But when he arrived one day, he saw that this older gentleman was closing up shop early. And he asked him, he said, why are you closing up so early? And the older gentleman said, well, because I made enough money for today. I'm going to go home and sit on my porch and drink some tea with my wife. The younger gentleman said, you can't close early. That's no way to run a business. You should stay open all day. The older gentleman said, okay, why? Well, because you can make more money, the businessman answered. Okay, and then what would I do, the sandwich salesman asked. Well, if you made enough money, you could open up another sandwich stand and, and you could make even more money. And the more money that you make, the more stands you could open. And the more stands you open, the more popular your sandwiches, your sandwiches will become all throughout the city. And the demand for them will be skyrocketing. And, and then you eventually have a whole chain of sandwich stands all throughout the city. The the older gentleman was interested. He said, okay, and, and then what would I do? Well, then you could buy, you could buy a new car. You could buy a, a bigger house. You could take some trips. You could hire people to manage your business for you. The older gentleman says, well, really? Then what could I do? And the young man said, well, I don't know. I guess you could just do whatever you want with your life. Like, you, you, you could just stay home if you want to sit on the porch and drink tea. The old man said, well, I can do that right now. I guess I have enough. He closed up a stand and went home to his wife. There's wisdom there. Better is a handful with quietness than both hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. Too many people lose out on the blessing of what they have for the desire of what they want, what they don't have. They lose out on the blessing of what God has given them right now for the desire of things that God hasn't given them. And maybe he never will. They rob themselves of the blessing of what God has allotted to them. There's another verse in Ecclesiastes 6, verse 9, which speaks to this. And Solomon writes, Better is the sight of the eyes than the wandering of the desire. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. The sight of the eyes is what you can see, what you can lay hands on, that tangible thing that you have in your possession right now. The wandering of the, the desire is just stuff that's out there somewhere that you sure wished and hoped and, oh, golly gee, I hope I can get enough money to buy that. It's better to cherish what you have right now rather than let it go to waste because you're pursuing other things. Secondly, not only did Agur pray for God to remove him far from him vanity, but he also prayed that God would remove the lies. I tell you, riches are so deceptive, aren't they? They... They deceive in the most elect. There are many lies that are associated with wealth. Mammon, Mammon makes many promises 
but it rarely delivers on them. How many of us have ever thought, if I only had this amount of money, I would be set for life? Come on, let me see. Anybody ever think that? You bunch of lying gas bags. Come on now. (laughs) If I just had this amount, I'd be set for life. But did you know that statistically, that isn't necessarily true? Posted on an article of debtfreedoctor.com. Sounds official, doesn't it? But in this article, studies showed that some 70% of all lottery winners ended up broke again, and the majority of them within two to three years of winning their millions. Studies also show that only two years after retirement, 78% of former NFL players, multimillionaires, have gone bankrupt and are in financial stress because they're jobless or because of divorce settlements. Marriages and families they lost because they were committed to chasing the American dream. Within five years of retirement, an estimated 60% of all NBA players are going to be broke. It's just as Solomon put it in, in Proverbs 23, 5, for riches certainly make themselves wings and they fly as an eagle toward heaven. Boy, isn't that true? It is a lie. It is a lie of riches. If I had this amount of money, I'd be set for life. It's a lie. Another lie that many people believe is that if they just had more money, well, it doesn't have to be this figure, just just more than what I have right now, then they would be happy. But oftentimes, when money promises a blessing, it delivers a curse. Proverbs 13, 11 says, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be dim- diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Proverbs 1, states, The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. And certainly, certainly that is proven through those lottery statistics that I, was, that I just read, where 70% of them end up broke. But did you know what? Many of them don't just end up broke. Many of them end up broken. Their lives shattered and destroyed because of their riches. It's what they call the curse of the lottery. It is a real thing. You can look it up. But friends, it isn't a curse at all. It's a principle that is taught in God's word. The prosperity of a fool shall destroy them. And it's shocking, which by the way, a fool is not just somebody who's stupid. It's, remember, the fool is one who denies that there's a God. Those who deny that a God are those people who don't live according to God's word. They pretend like it's really not God speaking to them. And therefore, if you're living outside what God's word says, guess what? You're a fool in this matter of money. And it'll destroy you. But it's shocking to read the accounts of those who, who win big in the lottery. Only to have their lives changed instantly, as promised. Changed instantly. But not for the better. It's changed for the worst. Look it up on the internet sometime. It'll break your heart to read some of the stories of what has happened to these people who thought that what they had received was was going to bring them so much happiness when in reality it brought them so much sorrow and even death. Families divided, marriages destroyed, lives threatened, homes and vehicles burglarized, constantly uh, money being stolen from them or them being conned out of money. I remember Pastor Greg Laurie telling a story one time of a man by the name of Jack Whitaker And he won $315 million in Powerball lottery. But shortly after he won that, he he was at a bar. That was bad. But he went to a bar and he was drugged. They slipped something in his drink. And the people working behind the bar who heard about his money went out to his car, broke into it, and stole $545,000 from him. Eventually, his wife divorced him. Because winning all that money changed him. Then a friend of his granddaughter was found dead in his home. And drugs were suspected because his granddaughter was a drug addict. In fact, three months after that, that 17-year-old granddaughter, who was the apple of his eye, he was going to leave all his money to her. He had just changed his will and it was all going to her. She died of a drug overdose, which, catch this, she purchased with that $2,000 a week allowance that he gave to her every week. After that, Jack began to struggle with gambling, with addictions, with alcohol. He was continually a victim of robbings and scandals and lawsuits. 
And he was quoted several times as to saying, I wish I'd just torn up that lottery ticket. Jack died July 1st, 2020. It isn't in the context in which he delivered it, but in the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson, money often costs too much. It costs too much. And there are a lot of people like Jack who are sitting in churches today who will not learn this lesson until it's cost them too much. And then another lie that many people believe concerning wealth is that if they just had a little more, they'd be content. But as we've already discussed, that's, that's just like drinking that salt water in order to quench your thirst. It's like the, 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 the multimillionaire um, uh, John D. Rockefeller had said whenever a reporter supposedly had asked him how much money is enough, and his response was, just a little bit more. Friends, that is always going to be the answer of those who have not learned to be content. Just a little bit more. Never be content. And that brings us back to the main point of this whole message and the whole point of Agur's prayer here. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. You remember what that word convenient means? What is proportioned, what is, what is allotted to me. He's praying, God, just give me that. And I wonder if you this morning could pray the prayer of Agur. You could pray honestly that God would just give you Remove this vanity, remove the lies, just give me what you proportion for me. I wonder if you could honestly pray that today and then walk away from this place completely content with whatever it is that God then puts on your plate. In spite of what you see God puts on the plates of other people, could you pray that prayer and honestly say, God, I'm perfectly content with what you have placed in front of me. I mean, I'm talking about with what you have right now. Would you be okay if your idea of what, God's, what, what God says is convenient for you, that is uh, your portion? Would you be okay if what God said is convenient for you is different than what you say or what you think is convenient for you? The secret to contentment is to love the portion that God says he's chosen for you and to trust that he's not just giving you what is good. We know that for certain, but he is not just giving you what is, what is necessary and good, but he is giving you what is best for you. That's where contentment comes. And the result of that is true, true wealth. Benjamin Franklin said, contentment makes poor men rich and rich men poor. Contentment makes poor men rich. Discontentment makes rich men poor. So Russell Conwell was a Baptist preacher who traveled around preaching in the 17th century he used to tell the story of a Persian, a true story, a Persian by the name of Ali Hafed, who owned a very large farm that had orchards and grain fields and gardens and lots of property. And Ali was a wealthy and a contented man until one day he entertained a guest who told him all about diamonds and how wealthy he would be if he could just go out and purchase a diamond mine. Ali Hafed went to bed that night for the first time to his knowledge in his life. He went to bed that night a poor man because he was discontent with all that he had. He wanted a diamond mind. Craving it so much, he eventually sold his farm to search out for those rare stones. He traveled the world over. He finally, after traveling and investing, became so poor, so broke, and so defeated that he committed suicide, taking his own life. And one day, the man who purchased Ali Hafed's farm led his camel up to one of the streams into a garden in order to drink. And as his camel put his nose in the brook, that man saw a flash of light from the sands of the stream. And he pulled from that stream a stone that reflected all the hues of the rainbow. That man had just discovered the mine of Golconda, which is the most magnificent diamond mine in all of history. 
had Ali Hafed remained at home, had he been contented with what God had given him and dug in his own garden, he would have discovered acres of diamonds. Acres. Instead of dying on a foreign field, far away with nothing to his name. There's a lesson here for us. Do we trust God in the portion that he has given to us? Do we trust God in the portion? And I'm talking about right now. Do we trust him enough to say, I know what you've given to me, God, is good. I know what you've given to me right now is best. And I I am not going to chase after the vanity. And I don't want to chase after the lies of riches. And if you, God, desire that one day I, I, that, that it is convenient for me to, to find diamonds in what you've given to me amidst your grace and your gifts, then so be it. But if not, God, I praise your name. Because if you don't want it, then it's not good for me. And chances are it would destroy me. Do you trust God enough to be able to pray that and to meet it in your heart? Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. If you are discontent with life, discontent with what you have right now, friends, let me tell you, the only solution is to go to God and look to Jesus. And you ask him, God, why? Why am I discontent in these things? I know these are gifts given to me from you. Why am I discontent? And you wrestle with God over that. But you pray to him, God, remove this from me. You will never find contentment outside of your relationship with Jesus Christ. Which brings me to this. If you're here this morning and you never accepted Jesus as your savior and you want peace and you want contentment in your life and I'm not talking about just with material things as we have learned this morning but I'm talking about you want peace and and, and contentment available in your heart for your soul, for your eternity. I'm telling you it's only found through Jesus Christ. There's something that God creates in every man and woman that we would seek out God and that we would worship. And many people fall short of finding the true God and they settle for false idols and they settle for false views and their own ideas of religion and what is holy and what is unrighteous. But I'm telling you, for those who seek God out and find him, they find contentment in Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and you have never believed on Jesus to be your savior, You've never given him your life trusting in the finished work on the cross when he died for your sins so that you could have forgiveness. I'm telling you right now, you believe on him today, you will have peace and contentment in your soul because you'll be at peace with God. And that contentment also is only found in relationship with Jesus Christ. But for the rest of us, church, I want to challenge us all this morning as we consider wisdom with wealth. How about this? Let's be wise enough to appreciate what God has given us right now and to trust that he has given us what is best. That we might even be able to pray the prayer of Agur this morning for our own lives.